Hello, how's everyone doing out there? Hope y'all had a great weekend. Um, if you can, go ahead and um, just let me know if the audio is coming in okay for you guys. Appreciate it. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the names. Randy Osborne, Fat Vegan, how you guys doing? Cody, Cody R, how you doing? T-Man, Willie Vasquez, Donald Best. Rob Cruz, Wistful Staffer, okay, Randy Osborne, how you doing? Polynesian Pip, how you doing? Aloha. So we'll go ahead and uh, we'll be getting started in just a bit. The main topic we're going to be looking at is this coin shortage that's going on. And um, there's actually you folks out there that uh, got me to take a look at this coin shortage. I mean, I know some of you folks have been saying it for a few weeks, but it didn't really dawn on me until um until recently um i was trying to buy something and um couldn't get change and there was another uh merchant he was asking for coins so um yeah i think in some places anyway some merchants are, are asking for coins as well over in singapore so that kind of uh, prompted me to go ahead and take a look at it so we'll go ahead and we'll get started shortly thank you guys again for being here Hello again, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Silver Bullion Television, SBTV. I'm your host, Patrick Vieira, and this is our live stream, our weekly live stream. Um, we're glad, again, that you folks could be here. A lot of things, as always, going on during the week. A lot of things happening, and um, we'll try to go over just a few just a few of these things. First and foremost, I just want to say hi to a few of you guys. I could, I could say hi to everyone. I would. Thomas Stoops, Jeff Spencer, John Cantrell, always be funding built for tough duck dive j okay thank you guys all for being here mes hello from pa uh first time i've seen you here emmy welcome aboard j i think same also so welcome aboard want to thank you guys for coming on board and and being here and if you are new to this channel please do subscribe hit the bell to be notified on updates and give us a thumbs up if you like what we do we really do appreciate your support and you can find us on social media. We're at silverbullion.com.sg. We are a precious metals dealer over in Singapore. You can find us on Facebook at Silver Bullion SG. Twitter, you can find us at Silver Bullion PL, PL for Private Limited. The audio versions can be found on bit.ly, bit.ly, SBTV iTunes, SBTV Spotify. And our crisis tracker group has been growing slowly but surely it's been growing and we do hope you folks join us there where we post um very very um pertinent news as far as the economy finance and of course gold silver things like that uh, if you have the telegram app on your mobile phone or even on your desktop just go ahead and um you can find us at crisis tracker so we do hope that um that we will see you there so again thank you all for being here appreciate that you that you made it and again, hope your weekend is going well. So let's see, Donald Best, I am doing fine. Thank you. I hope you're doing you're doing well yourself. Uh, let's see, Silver Honda, I'm starting to use cash just to get change to hoard it. Yeah, you know, I mean, again, this is something that even I'm seeing now over in um in in Singapore. Granted, it's I don't think it's as big as as you folks are seeing, but I've been seeing merchants popping up here and there asking for coins um even asking for a preference of cash so you know that that kind of um caught me off guard because singapore a, a lot of transactions are done electronically um so it, it kind of surprised me when i saw these things popped up and it took me back to what a few of you guys have been saying weeks ago if not months ago about this um coin shortage going on so i just wanted to take a look at it and you know it led me through a few different places a zig here, a, a zag there. I mean, it ended up going through the um, FDIC, ended up looking at bell ins, things like that. And, um, you know, it's it's a strange thing where why can't the, um, the U.S. Mint, whose job it is to make coins, I mean, why 
Why can't they? I don't know if keep up is the right word, but anyway, there, there, there's reasons why, I guess, and we'll, we'll take a look at those uh, shortly. So again, you know, how are you guys? How's everyone doing? Carrie Ellen Wilder from Pennsylvania. How are you doing? Grow Mechanic. How are you doing? Um, okay. So next week, um, our upcoming guest is going to be Chris Powell from Gata. And Chris, he always has interesting things to say. So I'm, I'm looking forward to see what he's going to have to say as well. He's the secretary and treasurer of the Gold Antitrust Action Committee, also known as Gata, which he co-founded along with Bill Murphy back in 1999 to expose the rigging of the gold market by Western Central Banks and their investment bank agents. So I do hope that you, um, you folks do sign up and hit the bell or subscribe and hit the bell so uh, we can go ahead and notify you when that, um, when that interview comes up. I'm pretty sure Chris is going to have some good things to say. He always, he always does. So looking forward to that. Uh, let's move over real quick and, take a look at uh, our website see what the uh, silver and gold price is right now hang on let me just go back a few here refresh this okay so right now um let's see what's going on in asia with silver and gold price this is our website silverbullion.com.sg uh, silver we're looking at about 1938 down just a bit gold we're looking at 1806 just a little bit down also but the day is just getting started, so we'll see how it moves throughout the day and especially throughout the week. And again, do download our investor kit. It's free, and there's a lot of good information in there. Just go ahead and click on this at our website, silverbullion.com.sg, and it's a free PDF. And also, it is a good idea to go ahead and sign up for a storage account. It doesn't cost anything. It doesn't cost anything to open up or maintain, but it... It's always good to have in your back pocket if in case that time does come where, you know, you may be looking at the um, the option of having something stored overseas as a form of wealth protection, wealth preservation. Maybe that day's today, maybe that day, maybe next week, maybe half a year from now. But again, it's good to have that option. And of course, our P2P or peer-to-peer -peer, um, secured loans, uh, these are basically... People who store with us, they can use their gold and silver as collateral to go ahead and get a secured low interest loan from other, um, let's just say, uh, members, other clients, customers who have accounts with us. So some people, they, they're doing pretty well and they have some money that they can go ahead and loan. And some people, they have gold and silver that they can use as collateral. So it's a peer to peer arrangement and we just facilitate the, um, the contract between the two and that's that's our role in it silver to gold ratio right now it's at 93.2 last week it was bouncing a bit between 93 and 94 so good to see it back in the 93 range um but we'll see if we can get down to maybe even below 90 by the end of the week i mean i think that would be pretty good i think a lot of you folks will be looking forward to that so we'll we'll see how that goes and moving over to Twitter, just want to take a look at some things that caught my attention. V-shaped recovery everyone was talking about, forget it. And I think we all knew this. It's an article from Bloomberg. I won't click on it. Um, Bloomberg, they, you know how it is. They give you, I think, what, three free, um, three free looks every month, and that's it. And you need to pay. So kind of used up the looks there. But anyway, forget about the V-shaped recovery. I think most of us knew this already. British Airways, the world's biggest operator of Boeing 747-400 jumbo jets, is retiring its entire fleet with immediate effect. And this, of course, is due to the, the bug. Uh, people just aren't, aren't traveling anymore. So the option they chose was to um, basically retire their entire fleet of 747-400s. I guess, you know, in some sense, you know, when you look at the Fed, giving out all that money to um, U.S. airlines. I mean, you know, what do you do? Retire some planes and go ahead and pick up new planes? Or, you know, I mean, nobody's really traveling right now. So, you know, it, as far as, you know, having your staff come to work every day, I mean, I think they're operating at um, 
less than full capacity anyway. So, I mean, you know, maybe these are some things that airlines are, are doing as options. But nonetheless, British Airways, they're retiring their full fleet of 747s. Daniel T. Martino Booth, in case you missed it, something similar may be happening now in the States with rising case loads, which, sad to say, means most states call it fear of shopping. A consumer drives the economy. If the driver keeps the car in the garage, well, you know. And this is something we kind of talked about before, where in order to have a healthy economy, you need to have a healthy population. If your population is not healthy, it's not out there, if they're in the garage, so to speak, that economy is not going anywhere. It's not going to be driving anywhere. So this is kind of what uh, Jesse Felder is saying. Um, CNBC, all of these uh, pretty fascinating workplaces from Google and other places like that, Apple, uh, their work environments, you know, they're, they are pretty unique, but um, guys are staying home. So this industry is going to change a bit. It's, it's just... Um, People aren't there anymore. People are working from home. So that, that'll that change. Uh, Daniel DiMartino Booth again, simply asinine. The Fed will not just emphasize actual inflation over forecasted inflation, but will also attempt to push the inflation rate above its 2% target. It's a whole new ball game. And yeah, the Fed, they're no longer interested in 2% target. They are more interested in pushing it above and beyond that 2%. And you know, the fear here is if they couldn't, if they couldn't get that 2% target rate for so long, you know, holding rates down at zero and trying to get people to spend, if they couldn't do it, the concern is if they go above and beyond that 2% inflation, high inflation, well, what makes them think they can bring that inflation back down? I mean, they tried for so long to get it up. Not so sure if they'd be able to bring it back down, and, and that's a fear. You could end up having runaway inflation. So again, from Bloomberg, um, won't be clicking on that. Uh, this is an interesting story. Uh, Japan is seriously considering to issue digital currencies, and uh, we'll go ahead and take a look at this because this is actually going to come into play with what we're going to take a look at later on as far as the coin shortage or confiscation. We'll, we have yet to... Um, See how this is going to unfold. But Japan is seriously considering to issue digital currency. So Japan's government is said to be seriously considering issuing a central bank digital currency. We've talked about this also, CBDCs. Japan's largest financial newspaper, Nikkei, reported the news last week saying that the government will include the CBDC plan in its policy framework for this year. Okay, it's this year. And the inclusion of such a plan in Japan's policy framework would make it official government policy per the report. This is where it gets interesting. Japan is looking to explore the possibility of issuing that central bank digital currency in coordination with other countries such as the U.S. and European nations per the report. Now, how you want to read this? It's up to you, but the way I read it, when it says in coordination, it means they're coming out together. That's the way I, I would I would take it. I would take it as they're going to release this together. And the news comes just a week after the BOJ, Bank of Japan, uh, the country's central bank officially said it would experiment with the central bank digi digital currency to check its feasibility from a technical perspective. So... Let's remember this story now, okay, because it uh, looks like it's going to come back fairly soon. Arcadia Economic, our friend here, Chris Marcus, uh, there has been a historically high purchase of physical silver via silver exchange-traded funds or ETFs in the past few months, says Peter Spina. So we'll go ahead and take a look at this article by Market Watch as to why silver is trading at nearly a four-year high. And this is their opinion. Um, as to why it's trading at four-year highs. Um, so we'll go ahead and take a look. Silver futures on Monday, this is last week, marked their highest settlement in nearly four years, buoyed by a sharp climb in investment demand as the metal continues to play catch-up against gains by its sister metal gold. 
And I, I agree with that. You know, we did see a lot of heavy buying again in silver. Trading in the gray metal is worth barely 10% of what gold sees each day. So hedge funds, hedge funds and other money managers wanted to catch up with the yellow metals jump towards new all-time highs. And this is probably in different currencies he re he's referring to. Might expect to get more bang for their buck in silver. Okay. So the September silver contract. Uh, let me see. Where is this dated? This is dated, um, okay, July 13th. So September, this is the forward contract, 2020. Uh, I suppose that's what he's talking about. Rose 73 cents or 3.9% to settle at 1978 announced Monday. That was the highest finish for the most active contract, <clears throat> excuse me, since September 2016. Okay, so we're seeing the prices starting to move and move up with hedge funds coming in. And there has been a historically high purchase of physical silver via silver exchange traded funds or ETFs in the past few months alone. Um, never in the history of silver have we seen such demand for the metal in such a short period of time. Uh, so this is pretty interesting. I mean, it, this even falls back to what we've seen where these uh, exchange for physicals were what, what we've seen with um, guys wanting delivery. Um, this is going to, we're going to see how this unfolds. This one definitely looks to be pretty interesting. And another story, uh, looming evictions may soon make 28 million homeless. Uh, we've never seen anything like this. And that this is going to play a role as well, um, where we are going to have more homeless. And there are studies that show that being homeless ties into to your overall health. Um, so health and home, they, they sort of go together. Zero hedge. <clears throat> and now comes the real fun extortion of billionaires and presidents for billions in Bitcoin in exchange for not leaking their direct messages to the public. And we saw this last week where Twitter, Twitter got so-called hacked. Uh, Mises Institute talking about how MMT is starting to make a little bit more sense. So a short clip on that in, in just a bit. And of course, coinless, then cashless. So we're going to take a peek at this also. Uh, a little bit more, a little bit more in depth. This one here is pretty interesting where you got bondholders that are actually taking over the, the company. So Pizza Paul is is what I think about when I read this. Fear of Pizza Express closures as chain faces takeover by bondholders. And we know the Fed is pretty much uh, buying up corporate bonds. So if this were the U.S., Jerome Powell might be making pizzas. Pizza Express is set to be taken over by its bondholders with the possibility of restaurant closures as the high street chain struggles with the loss of revenue during the bug. The chain's Chinese owner, Honey Capital, could lose control of the company as part of a debt for equity swap. A group of investors in bonds worth more than 465 million, this is uh, pounds, is in advanced talks over the deal, according to a source, the Financial Times first reported that talks were underway. So that one's pretty significant in, in, in the sense that you got the bondholders now who are getting involved. And uh, that's something different. Santiago Capital, there are no guarantees, not on the dollar, not on equities, not on gold, not on bonds. Can't even guarantee you won't be snipered by a monkey. Be careful out there. And that is true. Definitely be careful. So again, we'll take a look at this um, coin shortage. What's going on with Walmart? Well, actually, this is what, again, brought up the um, the topic of coin shortage. Um, back, maybe we'll, we can get into this a, a bit later. Um, Russell Napier, this is one quote he gave. We're going to take a look at another quote. There is a war raging in Europe. It is a war over who controls the money printing press. It is a war fought in courtrooms and behind closed doors in the corridors of Brussels, Berlin, or Paris. And again, this is true. Russell Napier, remember this name. We're going to take a look at, a, at another quote that he gave. This is, uh, she's trying to explain MMT, why it's not that bad of, of sorts. So we'll go ahead and take a peek at, at what she has to say. Now, if that's someone to say, oh, MMT, is the shorthand for MMT is, it's a school of thought that argues, as you said, that deficits don't matter and governments can print money freely without consequence. Now, if that's what MMT was about, <laughs> I would certainly quickly dissociate myself because that would be madness. 
Um, and, and so, you know, what are, what are we actually saying? Well, we recognize that the government is the issuer of the currency. And as a consequence, it is not financially constrained. Okay? It, it does not face a hard financial constraint. Does it therefore follow that the government, because it's not financially constrained, can just spend to infinity without consequence? The answer is, of course not. Okay, what we're trying to do, and I would say what MMT is about, if I had to give you an, like a single sentence, what is the MMT project mostly about? I would say it's primarily concerned with replacing an artificial revenue constraint, a financial constraint, with a real resource constraint, with an inflation constraint. So in fact, MMT centers inflation at, well, the center of the project. Okay, so that's uh, up and coming from, from Real Vision, I guess. Uh, but pretty interesting, she's talking about inflation. And then, uh, then again, we have uh, Jerome Powell and the Fed. I think they're going to make an announcement um, probably fairly soon uh, regarding this inflation or um, but they're, they're going to, bring something up even as far as maybe the, the, the yield curves with the bonds and things. So we'll see what they, they have to say about it. And I just want to get through these things real quick because I think you guys are more interested with the uh, the coin shortage topic. So I'll just run through these um, side topics real quick. Spain, rent out empty flats or I'll repossess them. Barcelona mayor warns property groups. And so what she's saying is um the owners of 194 empty flats in the on capital a month to let them out or she'll basically she's going to order their homes to be repossessed or their rental units to be repossessed and and this is interesting again because here we just saw an article about um guys are going to be homeless and then on the flip side here we have an article about there's too many homes that are empty and i think you gotta kind of take a look at the bigger concern with mmt and and then you got you know uh, pretty much a, a socialist mindset coming into play where maybe that second home is going to have to be uh it's going to be used by the government to to put people in i mean i it kind of looks like uh if you put the two and two together maybe that's that's on the cards uh you know again we we have yet to see if if that's uh truly going to happen but just to say that there's an excess there's an excess of homes and there's going to be um large numbers of homeless so we'll we'll see how this thing is going to work out together um let's see jose calvo sotelo it's beyond financial it's about freedom i mean i think if you're if you're referring to the coin shortage and money and things like that that is true um it, it a lot of it has to do with freedom it's not just financial freedom it, it's freedom in all aspects you know it's it's not just you know trying to be wealthy for financial freedom there are other freedoms that are tied into it um so it's 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 a good comment um that you had had said there or that you you put up um let's see what else is out there um michael b how you doing um okay so i just want to just glance through these comments real quick and see what you guys are, are talking about um let's see okay so you know i tell you we're, we'll move on we'll move on to uh the coin shortage thing because it it did get pretty interesting when I had to go and go ahead and take a look at things. And, and, and many people, they've been saying that there is a coin shortage. And as I was saying earlier, I, I know here in Singapore, I've seen a few places as well where the merchants are asking if you have coins. And, you know, if you have coins, don't be ashamed to use them. I need coins, basically, is what they're saying. If you have coins, give it to me. I'll buy them from you. I'll take them from you. Coin shortage as coin shortage here as well. I, I can't say... You know, definitely there is. It's just, you know, one or two places that, that I've seen that sort of popped up as seeing, you know, they have a coin shortage or asking for coins anyway. But within the, the states, I'm not sure how it is in Europe as well. Uh, that question came around or, or there was, you know, um, there, there are people noticing that there is a coin shortage. And uh, so taking a look at this article from Zero Hedge, the Fed begins rationing coins as Americans hoard cash. So having closed the U.S. Mint and halting production from the, um, let's see, and halting production after a surge in demand for gold and silver coins and warned of the danger of using bills, once again blaming the bug and choosing to quarantine cash for the sake of health, 
Fed Chair Powell quietly admitted to lawmakers this week that the Fed will be rationing coins as the circulation of coins across the U.S. economy came to a halt during the bug. And so this is what he told lawmakers, what Powell told people. What's happened is that with the partial closure, he's told people with the, the partial closure, um, basically coins weren't moving around. They, they weren't circulating. And um, he said that shortage was due to the mass business closures that prevented people from spending their coins as well as a lack of places that are open where people can trade coins for paper bills. We've been aware of it, he says. We're working to mint to increase supply. We're working with the reserve banks to get the supply to where it needs to be, according to Paul, adding that he expected this problem to be temporary. And so here's the thing. Do we believe Jerome Powell? I mean, he wasn't entirely truthful with us when he spoke about the repo market where the crisis was also temporary and that it was because businesses needed liquidity to pay their taxes. If I recall, he that's the role that he took to explain to us what was going on in the repo market. Obviously, it wasn't the truth. Uh, it wasn't the truth. There was a lot more than that. So the question is, do we believe this time around what Jerome Powell is saying? And um, I'm, I'm not so sold on it. I'm really not so sold on it. And, and the fact is, yes, there are three things that are going on right now with the acceptance of currency. We have a coin shortage. That's one. For merchants, they're asking for exact change only. If you're going to pay in cash, it has to be exact change only or straight up physical cash is just not accepted when there are transactions to be made. And I've run into these as well. Um, had a dinner. When it came time to pay, no cash accepted. And I'm like, well, okay. So this is something they should have told us before we sat down and, and ate. But again, this is what's happening where coin shortage, people asking for coins, um, exact change only, or no physical cash. Everything has to be electronic or digital. So, but in this, you really have to ask, how can a mint that makes our currency, makes coins, how can they not be essential? They are definitely essential. I mean, if, if banks were essential, then why wouldn't the money supply that the banks use be essential? So, so that kind of didn't make sense, you know, and, and I, I think for just about all of us, that right there is not going to make any sense. You know, the, the mint is essential. They, they provide the currency that, that we use. So I started looking off into why we, have a coin shortage and somehow things led me to hoarding, as mentioned, and the FDIC of all places started to pop up. And what's the FDIC for guys in the States or outside of the States, it's known as the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. And part of that reason was because Americans seem to be hoarding cash in that article or in this article as the St. Louis Fed points out. So this is straight from the, the Fed. So we'll take a look at the Fed article. Hang on, just let me get there. Okay. So again, St. Louis Fed, are Americans hoarding cash too? So this is one reason that they're given for the coin shortage hoarding. So during the ongoing bug, Americans have been hoarding hand sanitizer, ammunition, toilet paper. How's all that toilet paper doing? <laughs> have we gone through it all yet? and even cash. So reports of individuals making large cash withdrawals from banks suggest that there are, or that at least some members of the public are worried about the safety of their bank deposits. And I, I, would, I wouldn't just say some, I would say a lot. A lot of people are worried about it. Depositors have little to fear about the safety of their deposits. However, so long as their balance are below the current $250,000 limit, on deposit insurance coverage by the FDIC or the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Since the FDIC's establishment in 1933, no depositor has lost a penny of FDIC insured funds despite the occurrence of numerous bank failures during the financial crisis and subsequent recession in 2007 through 2009, as well as other times. 
uh, the FDIC was established to protect owners of modest-sized bank accounts from losing money if their bank failed. Thousands of banks failed during the Great Depression that began in 29, resulting in losses for many depositors. However, deposit insurance did more than simply protect account holders from loss. It went a long way to ending the banking panics that has that caused serious damage to the U.S. economy. So FDIC, it's, it's meant to... It's meant to protect us. And, you know, in, in, in a lot of ways, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. But we're going to get into that a bit more. And, you know, it's a good thing because money is insured. And, um, but something caught my attention when, when I took a look at it where the FDIC brought up a question to where I asked myself in, in taking a look at the first and last letters of the FDIC. And they stand for Federal Corporation. So that you know, it kind of made me take a little bit more of a look at it. Okay, federal corporation. So the question, of course, is, is the FDIC like the Federal Reserve in that it is a federal institution in name only? I mean, the FDIC is a federal corporation. And I could not find a clear-cut answer as to, is the FDIC a similar setup and arrangement like the Federal Reserve? So I wanted to take a little bit more of a look at that first because it's all It'll all start to tie in, as, as you guys will see. So Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, this is from Britannica.com. So let's go through this. The FDIC is an independent U.S. government corporation created under authority of the Banking Act of 33, also known as the Glass-Steagall Act, with the responsibility to ensure bank deposits in eligible bank or banks against lost in the event of a bank failure and to regulate certain banking practices. It was established after the collapse of many American banks during the initial years of the Great Depression, although earlier state-sponsored banks to insure depositors had not succeeded. The FDIC became a permanent government agency through the Banking Act of 1935. So it says it's a government agency and it's an independent U.S. government corporation. Okay, so make sense of that one. And this part here, the FDIC's income is derived from assessments on insured banks and from investments. Insured banks are assessed on the basis of their average deposits. And they're assessed on the basis of their average deposits. Okay, so let me, um, let me pull up one more article about the FDIC from the FDIC themselves. And it's interesting new. But they say, I mean, it's just a short, short little bit. But the FDIC, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, is an independent agency created by the Congress to maintain stability and public confidence in the nation's financial system. So here again, it's an independent agency. Well, the Fed, Federal Reserve, is an independent corporation. Here we have independent agency. We have federal corporate. Well, what is it? We're hearing all different names as to as to what they're they're calling it. So how would you define the FDIC, right? The company, the insurance insurance company that's supposed to um, make sure that that our money's safe. Is it the government or not? Is it independent, like the Federal Reserve or not? What do you guys think? Um, really, what what do you guys think about this? And lastly, did we catch where it read the FDIC's income is derived from assessments on insured banks? And from investments, insured banks are assessed on the basis of their average deposits. Who supports the money that the FDIC uses to insure banks? We do. We do. Because in turn, we support the banks. So, you know, in, in a strange roundabout way, we're the guys, you and me, we're supporting FDIC. So as mentioned before, this crisis with all the money in the Fed and other Central banks are pumping in to their economies and markets. You, you don't hear too much chatter about the banks, which I find strange. You don't hear too much news about banks and their health and what's going on, right? So it's pretty strange. You don't hear much chatter about banks, and that can be pretty troubling. I mean, is, is, anything, is anything more being hidden from us? I mean, when we go back to 2007, 2008, I, I remember Paulson or Geithner coming out saying, you know, we were two to three days away from a complete collapse, 
which kind of tells me if, if they didn't have a solution, they weren't going to tell us anything. It was just going to happen. So, you know, it, it, that, that's the thing, you know, if you're not hearing anything, you know, is that a good thing or, or a bad thing? Because 2007, 2008, we weren't going to hear anything at all until they, they figured out they had some sort of a solution. So we got to keep an eye on this one, be a bit, a bit mindful. We're just not hearing too much chatter about banks right now. So is anything being hidden from us? Now, aside from that, I'd like us to recall something from the 2008 crisis. And when we go back a little bit in time, this was a press release coming out in January of 2009. This is from the Board of Governors, Federal Reserve System. And it says, the U.S. government entered into an agreement today with Bank of America to provide a package of guarantees, liquidity access, and capital as part of its commitment to support financial market stability. And this is where it kind of gets interesting. Despite the, the money that um, was kind of just thrown out there, um, in this case, $118 billion. In addition, in addition, the Treasury will invest $20 billion in Bank of America from the Troubled Asset Relief Program, or TARP, in exchange, in exchange for preferred stock with an 8% dividend to the Treasury. Bank of America will comply with enhanced executive compensation restrictions and implement a mortgage loan modification program. But take note here, as a fee for this arrangement, Bank of America will issue preferred shares to the Treasury and FDIC. FDIC was involved. And even if we go ahead and take a look at another company, uh, again, another joint statement by coming from the Federal Reserve System, this one in November of 2008. So this is all pretty much the same. U.S. government is committed to supporting financial market stability, which is a prerequisite to restoring vigorous economic growth. Um, basically, they're just outlining some stuff. As part of the agreement, the Treasury and the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, FDIC, will provide protection against the possibility of unusually large losses on an asset pool of approximately $306 billion. Protection against large losses, what, what does that mean? They're going to bail them out? Well, what, is, what does that mean, right? Protection against unusually large losses. So anyway, $306 billion of loans and securities backed by residential and commercial real estate and other such assets. It's going to remain on their, their balance sheet. Uh, but as a fee for this arrangement, Citigroup will issue preferred shares to the Treasury and FDIC. So FDIC, they're in things. Things that we wouldn't maybe even even think of. You know, I, th I personally thought they were just the guys that make sure if, uh, if the bank got robbed that your money would still be safe. But in addition, the Treasury will invest $20 billion in Citigroup from the, the TARP program in exchange for preferred stock with an 8% dividend to the Treasury. Um, so anyway, FDIC had, had a role to play in some of these things. So again, uh, how would you define that, that government? I mean, the, the FD, FDIC, hang on, at the wrong place. So going back to the 2008 crisis, the Treasury, the government, or let's just say you and me, We've invested billions in the banks. Um, do, you, do you guys remember this? Uh, you know, it was, it's been a while back, but I think for this detailed part, maybe, maybe a lot of us had forgotten that. And not only are we invested where we gave the banks money, we also have preferred stock with them, 8% dividend. It's pretty good, right? But furthermore, let's keep the statement in mind from the Fed the U.S. government will continue to use all of our resources to preserve the strength of our banking institutions and promote the process of repair and recovery and to manage risk. So the FDIC, again, they also had a role to play in that um, 2008 Great Recession. Hang with me. Hang with me. You, you're going to, this thing is going to circle back to coins. Okay. Now, knowing a little bit about the FDIC, let's transition to what happens in things like, say, a bank run. And, you know, this can be directly related to fear, to hoarding, and even a bail-in. And we took a brief look at, at hoarding, where people, are, well, you know, they have a little bit of lost confidence, so they want the cash with them. They pulled some money out of the bank. So we took a brief look at hoarding, 
But what about a bank run? And why am I, why am I asking this? Because in China, there's rumored to be a, a bank run going on. Um, though it's it's small banks, there there's rumored to be a bank run, and this is coming from the um, South China Morning Post. So let's wait for this article to load up. Okay. Oh. Okay, so here we go. So this one here, oh, it's taking a while to load. Hang on, guys. Okay, so China's banking system begins to crack. Uh, this is fairly recent. As its grassroots, or at its grassroots, its two bank runs take place within a week. So two within a week. So local governments and police in both Hebei and Shanxi provinces were forced to intervene after rumors concerning Baoding Bank and Yangquan Commercial Bank. Sorry, China is hoping to rely on its small lenders amid the fallout from the bug to provide funds to small factories and farmers. So this was actually this was last month, almost a month ago, and so with China's. U.S. $40 trillion banking system seeing growing signs of trouble as its grassroots with bank runs are happening in two small local lenders about a month ago, a sign that a mountain of debt and unprecedented economic contraction has started to take a toll. Local governments and police in both of these provinces, which is a coal, and a coal mine town in Changji province last week, pleaded with customers not to withdraw cash from local banks despite various unsubstantiated rumors and so what was said is um about a month ago again the city of Baoding said in in its official wechat account that the bank was operating normally and people should not believe in or spread rumors okay so don't believe or spread rumors and should jointly be safeguarding good financial and social order after a group of depositors rushed to withdraw money from the bank. Even the police issued a statement saying it had arrested two individuals for spreading rumors that led to panic among the public. So three days earlier, the government and police were forced to issue a similar statement after local depositors rushed to the bank. And according to a local government, uh, they pleaded with the public not to withdraw cash from the bank in groups and be watchful of risks holding a lot of cash. And the odd part here is phone calls were made to both banks and um, they all went unanswered. So that's how bank run generally starts. Hang on, this is going to come back into coins, I promise. And that's how bank runs generally start, rumors. So is this bank run true? To be frank, you know, I guess we don't know, you know, but it is odd that, again, the reporters, which called for a response, it went unanswered. And, or they didn't get an answer. So the rumored bank, the rumored bank run, it's not necessarily the point. The point is the no response part of the rumored bank run. No clarity from the bank, just as there's no clarity from Jerome Powell. In this article, it is said that the local government pleaded, they pleaded with the public um, not to withdraw cash from their bank in groups and be watchful of risks of holding a lot of cash. Don't hold too much cash. It's dangerous, right? So local branches of China's central bank and the banking regulator also issued statements seeking to assure the public that their savings at the bank were safe. And it kind of made me wonder, going back to the FDIC, what would the, FDI, the FDIC do in case of a bank run or even perhaps a bail-in? Because now things start to unfold in, in that direction as well. I mean, people I talk to, they aren't concerned with their deposits knowing their deposits are insured, which kind of puzzles me sometimes. But nonetheless, let's take a look at what Jelena McWilliams, the FDIC chairperson, had to say this past March. We're living in unprecedented time. At a time of a pandemic like this, it is way too easy to get confused and to have fear about what you should be doing with your money in your accounts, especially as you're looking the at the volatility in the stock market and the financial sector. This is what I would like you to take away from this. Your money is safe at the banks. The last thing you should be doing is pulling your money out of the banks now, thinking that it's going to be safer someplace else. 
You don't want to be walking around with large wads of cash, and you certainly don't want to be hoarding cash in your mattress. It didn't pan out well for so many people. And I will tell you this, no depositor has lost a penny of their insured deposits since 1933 when the FDIC was created. So if you're talking about having your money in a safe place, please keep it in an FDIC insured bank. Well, that sounded pretty familiar. Sounded pretty familiar with what we just saw from the South China Morning Post. Almost exact word for word. You don't want to be holding too much cash. She says um, it didn't work out well, you know, for people who put the cash in their mattresses or something along those lines. And kind of makes you wonder, you know, kind of makes you wonder. But that surely sounded pretty familiar. Is it believable? Straight up, is this the bank? Is the bank, straight up, is the bank the best place for you to keep your money? Is it the best place for you to keep your money? Now, while you ponder that question, we're going to take a look at who Jelena McWilliams, the head of the FDIC, is, or at least we're going to take a look at um, a little bit about her, her family, which, which I found pretty interesting as, as well. Okay, so this is from... Um, CNN business, a little bit about her background. Her family lost its savings in a bank run in Yugoslavia. Now she's in charge of the FDIC. Now, I don't find this, I don't find it funny at all. I just kind of find it, you know, pretty I, I, ironic. You know, I mean, that her family the lost money well. I mean, through a bank had, run. The Let me pause grow, this. Uh, grow, um, and then now she's, she's the head of the FDIC. But nonetheless, Financial regulator Jelena McWilliams, the head of the FDIC, knows firsthand the devastation that can happen when the public loses confidence in the banking system. Her family was the victim of a run on banks in the former Yugoslavia in the early 1990s, a time when the country was being torn apart by civil war. Her father, dressed in a three-piece suit, waited 11 hours in line on a drizzly day to get money out of the bank in Belgrade but he was too late. By the time he made it to the teller, the money was gone. Okay, so her father, money was gone. Unlike the U.S., banks in, former Yugoslav in the former Yugoslavia did not have deposit insurance. When the bank's financial system collapsed and banks ran out of money, depositors had no recourse. Her father at that time, then 68, lost his entire life savings and was left little choice but to work as a day laborer earning Five dollars, five dollars a day. Quite the story. So I do agree with her in that you know having your deposit insured does does give you a layer of protection. However, two things kind of stuck out for me in in this this story. First, her father did not get to withdraw his money in time due to fear hoarding, which is where we are, short of a bank run right now. So second, let's say. In a currency event where your currency is falling or even failing, you will want to exchange your currency for another currency or smartly use your currency while it still has value to store your wealth in things like gold and silver. So in short, you need to be able to access your cash at all times. And I'm going to throw something back to you guys because you folks like to say this all the time, so I'm going to throw it back to you. I may say this, cash in banks. If you don't hold it, you don't own it. You got your cash in the banks, right? So you're not holding it. Do you really own it? We know the banks are going to use your money, fractional reserve lending system, right? Okay, so I just need to put that put that back on all of us there. If we like to say we don't hold it, we don't own it. Well, what about our cash? It's in the bank. Okay, so we all know when we deposit money or have an account, we basically, we're basically agreeing to let the bank go ahead and use our money with the hopes that when we want it back, it'll be there. And this kind of now unfolded into the topic of bail-ins. So banks, though fairly quiet right now, as mentioned, they're surrounded by global forest fires. They are surrounded, but the banks are still quiet. Still quiet. And when there is silence, something Something's usually going on. So in breaking down the door to understand the silence, we have to 
but we can't forget how banks are set up to implement bail-ins. Banks will do a bank run before you and I do. Bail-ins are going to come fast. They're going to come swift, and they're going to be in unison in order to be effective for the banks and governments. So for those of you who have not heard about bail-ins or feel a layer of protection via deposit insurance, here's a little bit of the history about it. It's just some... Um, just a short article. I mean, I just want to point out one, a uh, few parts of this article. So this came out in 2014. New G20 financial rules, Cyprus style bail-ins to confiscate bank deposits and pension funds. Okay. So I'm going to come down to this part here because this is where it's, um, it really opens up your, your mind a bit to understand things. Russell Napier, remember I, I asked you to remember his name. So here he is with another quote. Russell Napier, in writing for Zero Hedge, called it, or when this the G20 approved this, this bail-in scheme of sorts, called it the day money died. In any case, it may have been the day deposits died as money. Here's where it's interesting. Unlike coins, unlike coins and paper bills, which cannot be written down or given a haircut, says Napier. Deposits are now just part of commercial banks' capital structure. That means they can be bailed in or confiscated to save the mega banks from derivative bets gone wrong. So at that time, back in 2014, he was taught, or this is what he, he wrote about where. He was saying, unlike coins and paper bills, which cannot be written down or given a haircut, deposits are just part of the commercial bank's capital structures. And this is where, where the bail-ins come in, where the banks basically can, can take your deposits. But this quote kind of woke me up to see things from a very, very different, um, different perspective. And hang on, let me... um. And and this part here, when he mentioned that, it talked. Oh, sorry, guys. When he mentioned, when he mentioned that, you know, it, it again, it made me think a bit. Well, back then, okay. So he's talking about, um, you know, this um, the the bank runs or the bail-ins coming into play, and he's saying coins and and paper bills, they're not in play, um, at at, at that time. Uh, he was saying it's just deposits. But the interesting thing is now we're seeing coins shortage and paper bills. Maybe guys don't want to use them anymore. And, you know, he, because he's, he's saying, um, let me go back to that, that quote, unlike coins and paper bills, which cannot be written down or given a haircut. So he's saying coins and paper bills can't be given a haircut, but they could be confiscated or they could be rendered, um, rendered a bit useless so that's kind of what he's saying on that and and again it kind of made me think sorry about that guys this is how i i got from taking a look at a coin shortage to bank runs to bail-ins and one of our past guests jim Peterson, he sent me an email and he thought i'd be interested in in um seeing a, a video from james corbett and i did take a few parts of it and so i just want to go ahead and um just play a few clips from this 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 uh, post that he put, this video, and um, it explains a few things pretty well. Some interesting things, actually, about the nature of the banking system and how banking operates, one of which may be a surprise to some people out there. But yes, no, you're, when you take money and you put it into the bank, that isn't your money in the bank anymore. You are loaning that money to the bank, and it is theirs to play with as they see fit. And to engage in crazy derivative schemes and whatever else that can completely melt and dissolve trillions of dollars of notional wealth in a moment, and which will ultimately cause the loss of your deposit, which, again, is not your money. It is the bank's You are lending it to the bank. So you are just a creditor to the bank, and they can come in and reach into your bank account. But don't worry, the FDIC has totally got you covered. Um, well, first of all, in the Cyprus example, yes, uh, there was 100000 euro uh, uh, insurance on bank accounts in the eurozone, including in Cyprus. 
So don't worry, you're, you're totally fine, unless, you know, you're a business uh, owner or someone trying to actually, you know, make payroll and do things that have a cash flow, in which case you probably did have more than 100,000 euro in your bank account, in which case 50% of that was just gone because the bank said so, because, oh, the bank's in trouble, so your deposits are gone. <laughs> yeah, so that, that's one part I don't think a lot of times people, we, we understand this, but in the U.S., our deposit is insured up to 250000 in Singapore. I believe it's, it's 50000 It could be wrong. Now, if when a billing happens, any monies in deposit, 250000 and above or over, can be subject to a bail-in and not insured by the FDIC. Not insured by the FDIC. And I think it's fair to say the average Joe uh, more than likely does not have 250000 in savings or, or in deposit anyway in a bank account. So therefore... Only the wealthy should worry about this bail-in, right? Wrong. And we couldn't be, couldn't be more wrong. See, the wealthy provide jobs, employment, and if they are subject to a bail-in, a haircut, your employer may shut down. And that leaves the average Joe unemployed. So here's a few more things uh, James Corbett had to say. Are we going to see bail-ins in the GCC, the global COVID crash? Well, it is, as I say, it is a possibility. And we get this, for example, most recently, just in the past couple of days, from an article that was posted up to goldseek.com by Jan Neuenhaus at Voima Gold called Why Gold and Why Now, in which he notes, quote, the threat of bank bail-ins. Last but not least, a serious threat for people's fiat savings held at commercial banks are bail-ins. In, two in 2014, the European Union adopted the Bank Recovery and Resolution Directive, the implemented rules dictate that when a bank becomes insolvent, the bank's shareholders and creditors pay the costs through a bail-in mechanism. Money held at banks is technically a loan to the bank. This makes depositors unsecured creditors of the bank. Under the current rules, when the bank becomes insolvent, deposits will be seized to save the bank. Outside the EU, bail-in rules have been implemented as well. The reason why people are still holding large sums of fiat money at banks is because many aren't aware of the risks. End quote. So, yes, bail-ins are a possibility. The framework is there. Everything's in place. It has already been trial ballooned in Cyprus. So in the event of some sort of cataclysmic financial event, you better believe that the banks are coming for your deposits. But having said that, I don't see this current GCC, the global COVID crash, playing out in the same way as the 2008 GFC, the global financial crisis. This that uh, this problem that is happening right now is not primarily a financial event like the 2008 crisis was that had to do with those collateralized debt obligations and all that toxic garbage that was being rubber stamped AAA certified by the ratings agencies and all of that shenanigans that was going on. Uh, that was a lot to do with derivatives and, and fancy financial instruments. No, what is happening right now is the cessation of productive economic activity and manufacturing and distribution and actual physical, I mean, retail, all, all of this has been massively disrupted by essentially, a, if not a worldwide, at least a mostly worldwide cessation of all activity. It's uh, truly unprecedented, really. <coughs> and, uh, and so it is not primarily a financial event. So if bail-ins do come, they certainly won't be a first order effect of what we're living through right now. It would be the second or third order effect. Of course, the crisis, the financial crisis, or the economic crisis that's developing right now will have financial effects as people become unable to pay their mortgages, unable to make good on their various loans. Okay, so I, I think um, James Corbett, uh, there, there's a question out there about who he was. Full name, thank you. So I think the second, third effect uh, James is talking about is it's already knocking on our door and he's right where people probably do not understand or even know that keeping your money in a bank means you basically give your consent to that bank to go ahead and use your money if, if they want to or, or if they need to. Let me take a look at some comments and then I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll play one more clip from um, from James um, Corbet. So um, let's see. Michael Cole, solid illusion. Get out of the system. Um, yeah, that's the thing. Uh, we it's it's just getting much 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 harder to um understand 
our central banks, our, our governments who are supposed to be doing things for us, uh, helping us, uh, making sure, giving us that stability and whatnot. And um, it's just getting a bit harder and harder to really keep your full um, faith and trust in them. So that's a good point. And it is a reason why getting out of that system is having some things like gold and silver. Uh, they do. It looks like they will help you in uh, when things really do start to to turn anyway. Um, this isn't financial advice. It's it's just an opinion. Um, so, you know, disclaimer there, okay? Uh, so let me see what, what else is out there. Um, let me take a look. Pablo Pina, perhaps SDR will be issued as support for the fallout situation to temporary and temporary, though temporary and Russian China will be trading in their own terms and Iran. Um, CBDC backed by a commodity. You know, you've been hearing more about IMF and SDRs. It's been coming up more and more. And I think about maybe four or six months ago, I did see more articles on the IMF website about how they were um, trying to loan money to uh, emerging economies, actually mostly in Africa. They were loaning money to a lot of governments in, in Africa. So I think we're going to have to take an eye on that because a lot of the African nations, they're rich in resources. So, you know, it could be a, a control play as well. So we, we need to keep an eye on that as well. So one more clip from James. He had a, another thing to say. So I'll play that and then we'll, we'll move on. The real first wave, of course, is the immediate unemployment, as we've seen, of tens of millions of people in the United States, tens of millions more around the world. Uh, that has obviously had a dramatic effect on the basic ability of people to meet their needs that has, of course, been papered over by the unemployment checks that are coming in. But as soon as that starts to dry up, and assuming there are no more digital dollar schemes UBI created in order to paper over that, then that will obviously be the primary primary financial threat to the economic and financial well-being of the average Joe Sixpack and James Soccer Mom, more so than uninsured deposits in the bank. I'm assuming <coughs> most people, most of the average Joes and Janes out there, do not have hundreds of thousands of dollars or euros in their bank account that would be subject to these types of bail-in procedures. That probably is not what most people are thinking of as their, their first and primary uh, threat to their financial existence. Having said that, as, as I think uh, Neuenhaus uh, rightly points out in that article that we just read that passage from, uh, the reason why many people are still holding large sums of fiat money in the banks is because they aren't aware of these risks at all. They don't even understand that they are loaning their money to the bank. That's what a deposit actually is, and they don't understand how that works or the bail-in provisions or any of that. And it is, as always, that lack of understanding that will serve in the favor of uh, the banksters and those who are manipulating the system and against the average person who just doesn't even bother to look into the system that they are literally investing in, whether they know it or not. Uh, now, there are solutions to this, and I will once again invite people to look through the solutions tag on my site for many, many examples of how I've talked about, for example, how to beat the banksters at their own game, and I've talked about alternative currencies, and I've talked about credit unions and moving your money and all of these other ways of trying to get our money out of this controlled, rigged system where you are lending, literally lending your money, your hard-earned money to the banks for them to play with and then bail themselves out with your money when, uh, when they get into trouble. It's a horrible system and we should be taking our money, our time, our energy, our investment out of it in every way possible while we still can. Okay, so there you go in a nutshell. And, and I promise we're going to come full circle back to coins. In a nutshell, find ways to get out of the system. Gold, alternative currency, combination of the two. My friends, what do we make of this? What do we make of this? If the FDI, is the FDIC a government or private like the Federal Reserve? Federal Reserve is a private corporation. FDIC is a government corporation. If that makes sense to you, it, it's... The government is, is it serves the people. I mean, how how does the federal government have a corporation, especially on an insurance type of a corporation? So that that already seems a bit odd. The arrangement that it has, and I'm going to show you something else about FDIC. Hang in there. So I remind you of this statement: 
from Russell Napier. Unlike coins and paper bills, unlike coins and paper bills, which cannot be written down or given a haircut, deposits are now just part of commercial banks' capital structure. That means they can be bailed in or confiscated. Okay, confiscated to save the mega banks from derivative debts gone wrong. So think about that statement. And the disappearing coins and less and less usage of paper bills. So in 2008 crisis, coins and paper bills, as Napier said, could not be written down. But here's the thing. There was no crypto in that crisis, 2007, 2008, 2009. There was no crypto. There was no crypto, no blockchain, no alternative for them like we have today. Okay? No alternative like what we have today. With digital currencies, with the blockchain, there was none. It was, but today, it is absolutely possible to, let's just say, write down coins and paper bills or flat out get rid of them. Flat out get rid of them, confiscate them, make them useless, especially if you have something else waiting in the wings. And I'm going to go back to that article that I showed you, that something else waiting in the wings. When you go back to that article from Yahoo Finance and Japan, where they are seriously considering to issue digital currency. Now, I don't know what the factors are for them in making the decision to go with it or not go with it. But the part that stands out for me is when we come down here. Japan is looking to explore the possibility of issuing central bank digital currencies in coordination. I'm interpreting that as being in unison with other countries such as the U.S., and European nations per the report. So disappearing coins and cash, could they be part of a sort of a soft bank bail-in right now? And are, are they just being confiscated? What's going on with it, right? What is going on? So we've been hearing that word confiscated quite a bit. Are our coins and paper bills being confiscated? Is it? Is it being phased out by design, by plan, or necessity? If so, why? So these are exactly the types of things that need to happen in order to bring in a cashless world. No conspiracy stuff here. There's no conspiracy stuff here. Cashless, cashless is, is, where, is where we're going. Okay. Neophyte Sacker, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, thank you very much. Um, you're welcome. Thank you guys for being here. Um, yeah, thumbs up even, we, we appreciate that. We appreciate that as well. But when we go back to that article from Yahoo Finance when it talks about Japan in coordination with U.S. And, and Europe, and when you look at these coins disappearing, when you look at uh, businesses that want exact change only or they're not even accepting paper bills, it, you got to kind of kind of wonder, I mean, who's who has all these coins and paper bills? Banks. Right? I mean, that's where it all ends up going to. If, if it's not circulating, it ends up, well, the banks have a bunch of it. And what happens? You know, is it being taken back? Is it being recalled? Is it being confiscated? Or, you know, what, what is it truly? What's, what's going on with it? So let's get back to the intention of this live stream, which was a coin shortage. So all of this money being thrown around and given by the Fed, it's a loan, Right. The loan needs to have collateral by law. We know this. We've gone over this. So what's the collateral? Taxes. Taxes is part of the collateral, which is why even though all this money is being thrown around, we still have to pay our taxes. That's the collateral. You and me, our taxes. So how will maximum taxes be collected with no one avoiding it? You take away physical currency, including coins, and all transactions go on a digital ledger. For money to go on a digital ledger, money needs to be all digital. No paper bills, no coins. Collateral for all these loans, now it starts to straddle between our taxes and the loans from the Fed as being almost like an investment for, for complete control. And in addition, cashless, it makes you traceable, which fits the bug narrative. We're seeing more and more, wherever you go, some form of contact tracing is in effect. And one more thing, this is what the FDIC says about non-cash payments.
payments. And, and these these next two articles are going to be very important to to take in. So in a digital economy, what are my options? What are my my options? Whether it's ordering takeout from app-based food. Hang on, let me um, slide this over if I can. Hang on, I realize it's um, off screen. Okay, hang on. Okay, so whether it's um, order taking, sorry, we don't want that. So whether it's order taking, sorry, it's just a bit out of view there. Whether it's order ordering takeout from an app-based food delivery service or using a rideshare app to get home, cash may not be an option for payment. More retailers are now accepting cashless payments to reduce exposure to high-touch surfaces. Okay, this is what it's all about, the bug. When you are used to paying with cash, this can be challenging. Here are some options available to you other than cash or traditional credit and debit cards. Prepaid cards. A prepaid card allows you to use a card to make purchases at stores or to pay bills online without accessing a bank account or using a credit card. These cards usually are not linked to a checking or savings account uh, and require you to load money onto the card up front so we can find more information at this link here and we are going to take a look at that so remember Nuchin a month or two months ago you know showing the new debit card that the treasury is going to be issuing right so here are some prepaid card types you have reloadable prepaid cards a payroll card which is a prepaid card you get from your employer on which you can receive your paycheck or salary Government benefit card, okay? College ID cards. So sometimes, for some colleges, they offer a card that you can use to pay for things on the school's campus and possibly some nearby stores. Uh, so other schools offer a card you can use at any retail location that accepts the network brand and even gift cards. Okay, so these are some other types of um, other options for a cashless system. Okay, so here's the part. When we take a look at, see the FDIC for, for more info, right? That link that they had. This is where it all ties in. To protect your funds, make sure your card is insurable and registered. You got to be registered. Banks insured by the FDIC offer a wide variety of financial products beyond traditional checking and savings account including prepaid cards. A prepaid card allows you to use a card to make purchases at stores, withdraw cash from ATMs, or to pay bills online without accessing a bank account or line of credit. Since these cards usually are not linked to a checking or savings account, consumers often ask, does the FDIC also insure the funds on my prepaid card? The answer could be, could be yes, but there are some important initial issues to understand if the FDIC insured bank that issued the card was to fail the funds available on your prepaid card may be insurable as long as your prepaid card is eligible for FDIC deposit insurance coverage or you are properly registered for the card okay so I think you don't really need to read to um too much more there I think we all kind of understand this already, right? So combine this and articles we've gone over before where the Fed and other central banks are creating a central bank digital currencies and even wallets. I mean, what do we say? Stick a fork in it, gang. We are on our way to a completely, completely cashless world. I don't think we can stop this. And as I've said before, the best thing we can do are to find stores of wealth wealth protection, preservation, things like gold and silver. We're going to have to get through that transition from where we are today into that new system that they're going to put on us tomorrow. So this is where that whole wealth preservation, wealth transfer, all of these things, store wealth, where they, this is where they come into play. And it's something we got to understand. I want all of us to understand that we are going to, we're going to need to have options. Coin shortage or coin confiscation. You decide. You decide what it is. 
Jerome Powell says, you know, the economy will shut down for a while. The coins weren't moving, so it has to get back up to speed. He says they, um, they're rationing it where they're trying to make sure that all places in the country have a, have a fair share or equal amount to make sure things can, can operate smoothly. That's what he says. Coin shortage or confiscation, you decide. Because in the end, we're all going to have to decide on what we're told by the Paulos that be versus being a little bit more wide awake and what we see them doing, building, repairing, and planning for tomorrow. We're all going to have to make decisions on this. So I know it's a bit long again, but thank you guys for for sticking around. Um, I just found it pretty interesting that I started out looking at this coin shortage and then somehow the FDIC starts popping up. And then when you look into FDIC, you, you kind of wonder, well, what is this organization about? Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Federal Corporation. Okay, well, how does this thing work? They're independent. So, well, what does that mean? How do we have a federal corporation that's that's independent? You know, so what what's going on with it? You know, so you kind of start to question, is this almost like the same deal? Excuse me, almost like the same deal like the Federal Reserve. You know, what what's going on? And then you realize FDIC, they already have it more or less planned out. So I'm sure other agencies have it planned out where how they're going to maneuver people through and enable them to use a cashless system. And as I've said, you, you know, you if you're going to have a cashless system, you can't have physical money. You can't have physical coins. You can't have physical paper bills. And some of you guys smartly pointed out very early on that when the bug first came about, you guys were saying, watch the cash, watch the, the physical money. You know, that this may become, um, the bug may become a reason to, to get rid of it. Um, can't say 100% it is, but when you look at um, things the FDIC is pointing out or putting out, when you look at what the, even again, what the Fed is doing, things like a coin shortage. And again, I've, I've seen a couple places also here in, in Singapore where merchants are asking if we have coins you know, so we can go ahead and, and make change for these, these coins. So you got to kind of wonder, you know, where are all these coins going and why? And so in a little bit of research here, I, I wish I had more time. Things kind of pointed in this direction where, you know, what really ties it all up is that article from, from Japan where um, they're looking at doing it um, together with U.S. And, and Europe. So, I see it more as a timing thing. So it, it's it's going to get interesting, guys. It's definitely going to get interesting. So um, take a look at some comments. Danny, the plumber, you always got great comments, my friend. Thank you. Those are the questions we, we need answered. Um, I think I might have missed <laughs> what questions you, you were referring to. But for me, anyway, these these are the questions that, that we gotta that we got to take a look at and, you know, really try and figure out what's going on because it is going to come down to to that transfer getting from where we are today to where or getting from the money supply today to the money supply that there or the monetary system excuse me where we are today with this monetary system and how it's going to transfer over into a, another monetary system so i lost my train of thought there because m bellinger <laughs> Thank you, my friend. It's quite a bit. Uh, thanks for informing the masses on the truth. Anyway, this can just push uh, down the road. Sorry. Having metals and Bitcoin in your possession makes sense. Diversity. And then can, you know, true. Sorry, disappeared. That That is true. Um, and we've been saying it for a while where, you know, have cash, um, especially for things, let's say, like a market market crash. You have cash. You can you can get in on those those better quality stocks, blue chick stops, whatever it is, you have your, your cash, you can go ahead and, and pick up companies. And then if we have a currency crisis, although you don't really want that cash, uh, that's when your cash has an expiration date on it. That's when you may want things like junk, silver, gold, silver, things like that. Uh, those, there'll be a store of value when the currency, when the fiat really starts to take a hit. And then the thing is with the gold, silver, hard to transfer them um, in order to make payment. And that's where something like Bitcoin comes into play, where that Bitcoin can be your currency, where it can be used to, to transfer 
stores of wealth. And that's where other things like a gold back token, like cash gold token, C-A-C-H-E gold token, where this token is, is unique and um, disclaimer, I, I do have a micro share with it, but that's where this, this token is very unique because the gold is actually, I like to say it's in the front <clears throat> of the token, not a gold back token, but a token that exists because gold exists. Other tokens, you know, they like to say gold back token and maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but you know, some things that kind of make you wonder is things like, do they have a storage fee? Cause I, I like to look at it as if you're telling me you have a gold back token, but you're not charging me a storage fee, then maybe it's because you're not storing anything. You know, that's kind of the way I look at it. I, I could be wrong. That's just my own opinion when, when I look at it that way. So I like to look for gold back tokens that actually do have storage fees that can prove to me that, that the gold is there. And, and again, why gold back token? Because, you know, it, it's something that, um, you know, it, it has a little bit more, a little bit more to it. Um, it, it has something that we know as, as money, you know, it, that component is there. And so that's why I like gold back tokens or asset back tokens. So, you know, again, you know, as, as Bellinger pointed out, um, it's good to have some Bitcoin for sure. It's good to have cryptocurrency guys. And I know a lot of us gold and silver guys, we, we don't like cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency guys don't like, don't like gold and silver guys. But the truth is we need something that we can use to be able to transfer money. And um, we, we have to be open, be open to it. So again, thank you for that. Uh, Fat Vegan, thank you as well. Um, dimes, quarters, half dollars, uh, 95% count. Mm, I'll say 90% copper, but yeah, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. And and that's where junk silver comes into play because this is something, you know, again, market collapse, currency collapse. And the next thing people know as money once currency collapses is junk silver. I mean, we've grown up with quarters, dimes, nickels, things like that, at least in the States anyway. And so people will recognize that part as being money. And once they're educated as to there's actually silver in the coin, uh, then it transitioned over into the gold and silver, the straight up bullion coins. So it's a door. Junk silver is actually a door to help people walk in to understand the um, things like silver eagles, silver maples, things like that. So um, it, it does have a role to play because, uh, I, you know, I think if um, it's going to be a very trying time, you know, people are going to try and figure out what, what can be used as money. And the thing most people know is gold and silver. And then after that, well, how can I transfer or make purchases? How can I transact? And that's where things like Bitcoin come into play. And then again, that's why I, I look at things like a gold back token, uh, because it has both, both items in it. So again, uh, fat vegan, thank you. Um, so again, I, I think, um, I think we'll, we'll wrap it up with, with that. Um, appreciate you guys being here and, uh, the questions and comments that you gave, because again, um, you know, really, there are a lot of guys on the fence and they're trying to figure out what is this talk of gold and silver and crypto and, and all of these things. They're trying to figure it out. And it's, as I said before, I don't think there's any one thing that I could say that's going to convince someone to to make a move either way. It's more you guys. It's It's more of you guys and the comments that you put out there that are going to help others who are on the fence understand uh, which which way they should go, which way they should move. So for that, I, I thank you guys for it. You, you are truly the ones that are going to be helping a lot of people. For us, we're, we're a vehicle, we're a place that can help people for sure. But to help people understand a bit more, um, to help persuade them in some ways, this way or that way, that's really you guys. You know, uh, We do what we do, but you folks do what you do as well. And we appreciate that. So again, I want to thank you all for being here. I do hope this week goes well for everyone. Um, just want to see us all get through this. As I've said before, we are all in the same boat together and, and we'll get through. We will get through. So having said that, Chris Powell again coming up this week. Hope you guys can make it for his interview. I appreciate the thumbs up. And as always, saddle up for what's coming ahead and silver up as well. I'll see you guys. Take care.